everybody. This is Kat Nip on Tuesday, June 23rd, 2020 with our podcast for Press Reset World. Started with the idea that COVID-19 can be a great time to reimagine our world and what we need to do. Today, I am virtually joined by Jennifer Houghton, president of Boundary Forest Watershed Stewardship Society and the maker of the Grand Forks flood documentary. And we're going to talk about some of the myths and realities of our modern forestry practices. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Kat. It's my pleasure to be here. Yeah, and I really want to start off with your story and how you got involved, but I'm just going to say that part of why you're here is because we had another uh, guest who mentioned uh, something about clear cutting, and I said, I, I don't think that that information is correct anymore. And so we do want to get to those myths, but I really, I'm fascinated with your story and what you've done. So tell us a little bit about how you got involved so passionately in forestry. Well, I didn't know too much about forestry in BC until about two or three years ago. And what happened was I moved to Grand Forks, which is in Southern BC uh, in 2016. And then in 2017, my house flooded. And there were a few dozen other homes in Grand Forks that flooded in 2017. And then in 2018, there was what people have been calling the most catastrophic flood that BC has ever experienced. So 2018, I had four feet of water in my house and there were 400 other houses in Grand Forks that were impacted as well as dozens of businesses in the downtown core. And so after having gone through the 2017 flood and, and the stress and the devastation of trying to recover from that, I looked around town in 2018 and I saw, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people being impacted by it. And I thought, well, I'm going to film our story. And I'm, I'm not a documentary filmmaker, so it's something I just dived into. I thought, our story needs to be told. You know, I was going to the grocery store the day after the flood and I was seeing people, they were just in shock. and. Um, so I started filming immediately after that and in the course of filming the documentary I realized well I need to find out why this flood happened and people started telling me about forestry and it wasn't a topic that I knew too much about. Someone referred me to an ecologist and forester who lives in the Silicon Valley named Herb Hammond and I went and I interviewed him and he really opened my eyes to the connection between the clear-cut forestry that's happening in BC and not only the Grand Forks flood, but also other ecological problems and other flooding and landslide issues that are happening in BC. And I was shocked to see overhead photos of BC and the level of the amount of clear-cut forestry that's happening. Um, and I didn't realize this was going on. Uh, so I've I've spent a lot of time educating myself in the past two years and being involved with uh, people who've been doing this for a very long time, ecologists, professional foresters. I've interviewed old time loggers, um, both local and across the province. I've attended uh, events across the province. And we also, I'm co-founder of, like you said, the Boundary Forest Watershed Stewardship Society. We formed a group here to try and work towards more um, ecologically and economically responsible forestry practices in our watershed. And so um, that's the connection between flooding and forestry for me. I, and again, this year in 2020, this spring, I was flooded again. Uh, there weren't as many people flooded this year as there were in 2018, but um, it's been devastating. It's been a traumatic experience to go through three floods in four years. Um, and uh, so it was my decision to, to turn this into my purpose. And, yes. and um, so my life, my life has been changed, not only by the flooding, but also the discovery about, about the forestry issues and, and the devastating impacts of it across BC. Okay. So, so you, you weren't a filmmaker by training. So did you go and get some help? Did you just do it on your iPhone? What did you do? <laughs> yeah, I, I, somebody lent me a camera. I had my own Sony Handycam and I used some of it I did on my, my phone. Um, and I just dived in basically. I went and I filmed what was going on around Grand Forks. I filmed 
people inside their homes when they were visiting them for the first time after the flood, looking at all the devastation. Um, mm -hmm. I filmed, you know, the, the pi giant piles of stuff that people were taking out of their homes, the drywall, the furniture, all of their damaged stuff on the roads in, in Grand mm -hmm. Forks. Um, and I just went for it. I've got hundreds and hundreds of hours of footage. Um, I've turned it into a series, so it's available on YouTube. Um, I still have a lot more uh, episodes to go. So, so far, three episodes have been published. Excellent. So oh, we'll, we'll, put the, we'll put those up and uh, so people can find the, the YouTube series. But I think it's pretty easy to find. I found the trailer for the original thing. And the GoFundMe page is there still. Is it still active? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, then good. It's one way people can support. Um, so here comes down to the, the question that came up in a previous interview. Do we still do clear cutting? Because I think a lot of people like my guests, think that clear cutting was banned a long time ago. Nope. Uh, clear cutting is the predominant form of logging that's done in British Columbia. Industrial forestry, i.e. clear cut forestry, is the way it's done. There are very few exceptions in British Columbia. The majority of forestry in BC is clear cutting. Um, the BC government, the, the legislation um, that was created by the BC government decades ago supports, encourages, props up this kind of clear-cut logging. That is what is done. So when we talk about clear-cut logging, for example, for, for something that's in our watershed um, at a, a zone called Hornet Creek, our group, we went and we looked at what was happening there before BCTS, um, BC Timber Cells, logged it. We were looking at their plans. So their plan said that they were going to leave 12 to 20 stems per hectare when they logged it. And so a hectare is two and a half acres approximately. So if you imagine two and a half acres with 12 trees left behind, that's clear cut forestry. And the clear cut forestry that's happening is done, and this has been going on since the 70s in BC. And the clear cut forestry is done with feller buncher machines or these huge machines. They go in, they cut down virtually everything in their path. They roll over the soil, they roll over all of the, the ground cover, and they demolish the ground cover, they destroy the function and the composition and the structure of the forest floor, and they leave behind very, very few trees. And there's a reason we're getting the kind of floods that we're getting down at the bottom of our drainage basin. So Grand Forks is at the confluence of the Granby River and the Kettle River, we're at the bottom of the drainage basin. So with all of the clear cut forestry that's going on in our watershed, um, the, the intact forests that used to manage our water forests, they're not there anymore. The, the composition and structure and function of the forest and the forest floor have disappeared as a result of the amount of clear cut forestry, forestry that's going on. So, there's nothing holding the soils in, the sediment is coming down, and, and it impacts the snowpack as well. So it's massive erosion, and, um, and it gets down to a soil that it doesn't have any nutrients anymore, I imagine, too. The ground yeah, it, contributes to that, I'm sure. Exactly, yeah. The clear-cut forestry is incredibly damaging to the structure, composition, and function of the forest floor. And... Another thing that happens when they do clear cuts is that um, clear cut areas accumulate 30 to 40 percent more snowpack than intact forests. Mm -hmm. And the snow in those clear cuts melts at 30 to 40 percent faster rate. And so we're getting more snow, it's melting faster, and it's creating these huge peak flows in the spring that never used to happen. And not only that, but the erosion that you mentioned, there's tons of sediment coming down and it's settling in the bottom of the drainage basin around Grand Forks. So the river bottoms are rising. So there's more water coming down. They're ending up in a river that has a lower bottom and it's spreading out across areas that didn't used to get this kind of flooding this often. Right. Yeah, when I talked to Curie, Seafried of uh, the Compost Education Center, starting to learn about soil and learning about how important ground cover is for retaining water. So if you're doing any rainwater harvesting, you know, you want to have uh, 
and you want to keep your soil and you want to keep your your water you have to um you have to have ground cover so that the farms uh like in the little biggest farm uh fil the film about the little biggest farm that they their farm was saved because they kept all the ground cover um, from floods where the other farms were flooding so terribly important yeah and people have, there's been a, a video that's going gone around social media it's on youtube where they people have made two boxes and in one box they've got just soil and in the other plexiglass box they've got soil with plants in it and they pour water in the top and the water in the the box with just the soil pours right through and the water in the box with the plants slowly trickles out. So it's, it's pretty much common sense that, yes. that plants are going to hold our water in for us. And also all the dead material in an intact forest, all the, the dead trees that fall and all the stuff that accumulates on the forest floor, that also holds in water and it slowly, or it slowly puts it back out into the system over the course of the season. So what's happening here is we're getting huge amounts of water coming down in the spring, and then we're getting drought in the summer because those old logs, the dead logs, even in uh, um, even burnt logs hold water too. They redistribute it out into the system over the season. So intact forests not only manage our water for us, but they, they help us, um, they, they help with the climate as well. Intact forests are, in, are yeah. managing our climate for us. So all of that moisture that was normally held that cools things down, that's disappearing as well. Right, right. Um, yeah, and people, I don't under, think they understand that when polar ice caps melt, that means more moisture goes into the, so there's more water in the atmosphere too. So we have to learn how to manage that. And if we're not managing our forests and our soil, we're not paying attention to the plants and we're destroying them. Um, well, let's get to myth number two. This kind of brings up, which is, are trees a viable renewable resource? Right, and that depends on how you define renewable. Okay. Depends on how you define resource. So, if a few weeks ago I went up into our watershed and I was looking at a clear cut that had been done probably 10 to 13 years ago. And it was this huge, it was acres and acres of land. And on part of that clear cut, they had planted some trees that were still successfully growing. So there was some large and there was some pine, but on the other big section of the clear cut, there were no new trees grow, growing. And I went and I looked at the logs that had been cut and I counted the rings and they were over a hundred year trees. Sad. And so how long is it going to take for those, those tree plantations to grow? Um, they might come and cut them down in 30 years. Maybe they'll cut them down in 50. Maybe they'll cut them down in 70. But the fact is it's going to take 200, 300, 500 years for that forest to redevelop into something that it used to be and provide the ecological services that it's, it's provided for us. So managing our water, managing our climate, um, protecting biodiversity, um, uh, you know, all of the ecological services have disappeared. Right. And, how, and from an economic point of view, if, if you take farmland, for example, and you harvest it a particular way that makes it incapable of producing the same economic value for another 50 or 70 years. Is that a renewable resource? And, and that's what's happening. They're, they're using clear cut um, harvesting techniques. They're using feller buncher machines. They're destroying the land to such an extent that you cannot get the same, same economic value out of it probably ever because yeah. the trees they're going to come and cut down 50 years from now, they don't have the same economic value as the 100 year old trees that they cut down in the first harvest. Right. So how renewable is that? Yeah, no, no. It reminds me of the Dr. Zeus book, The Lorax. I don't know if you've seen, seen that one. It basically says we're screwing ourselves. And, um, and it's been known for a long, long time. So, so why do we keep doing it? Like what are the, how damaging are these current practices? And, and, are forestry companies and government lying to us? What, what's going on? 
so why we keep doing it in BC um, is because of the way that um, people who are interested in profit, industrial forestry companies, were able to get legislation rewritten so that it supports industrial forestry. So the legislation in BC supports it. There's something in the BC um, forestry legislation called the professional reliance model. So that means that the people who are making the decisions about forests in BC are people who are professional foresters and they're the ones who are in the employ of industrial forestry companies. Um, there's also something it, written into the legislation. It's commonly called the unduly clause. And so it essentially says that no other priorities, no other values can interfere with harvesting volume. So what we've got is legislation that puts people who want profits in charge of our forests. Mm -hmm. So they're not, they're not there for the public. Uh, it's not serving the public interest. And people who work in the industry will say, well, jobs, jobs, jobs. And the government will say, well, we need those stumpage revenues. But what the what industry is built for is it's built for short term profit and we're losing out the public is losing out because we're losing all of the services that forests provide for us and and most of these companies are multinational so once they've logged us out they're going to take their profits and they're going to go build a sawmill in the southern us or in um europe and and the government has to pay for these floods too ultimately, do they not? Yeah, it, it doesn't make any sense because I, I, I did a calculation and I calculated the cost of the Grand Forks flood. And uh, it was approxim approximately, including business losses and the cost of disaster financial assistance that was provided by the province and the cost of the new flood infrastructure that they're building, it, it amounts to $103 million. And that's not total losses. So $103 million for one flood. And how much has forestry contributed to our local economy? I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, okay. Um, so what should our forestry practices be? Well, there are examples of it, um, small examples of it happening in BC. Um, sometimes it's called eco-forestry, sometimes it's called ecosystem-based conservation, uh, sometimes it's called selective logging. And one of the communities that's doing this kind of logging is Harrop Proctor, and that's just east of Nelson. Okay. So they've got a co-op, and the, the members of the community got together, and they created a community forest that's run using a co-op model, and they use an ecoforestry management system. So what they do on their uh, 11,000 hectares of land is they go in, and the first decision that they make is what needs to be conserved. So they look at eco-sensitive areas, they look at riparian zones, they look at you know, biodiversity, they look at species at risk, and those areas are set aside. That's the first thing they do. And that's the opposite of the way things are done with industrial forestry. Industrial forestry, they, they calculate how much harvesting volume they want, and then they go from there, then they make the decisions. So here at Proctor is, and also using selective forestry methods when it harvests. So it's not using feller bunchers to cut down all of the trees. It's leaving trees behind in the areas where they are logging. And uh, one of the things that Harrop Proctor um, has discovered by doing this method of forestry, I'm gonna read some stats here. Um, they create, in the woods, they create per, cubic, per thousand cubic meters harvested they create two times the number of jobs than the provincial average. And in their sawmill, they create eight times the number of local jobs than the provincial average. So not only should we be doing this ecoforestry for the ecological benefits, but also for the economic benefits and for the future economic benefits, because um, like, what, for example, what do they do with their logs? Do they sell them on the market too? They do. Yeah, they, but they get a lot of locals coming and buying wood directly from them, directly from their sawmill, which is different from the sawmill model in the rest of BC. So for example, the, 
the, the Interfor sawmill that's here in Grand Forks, <laughs> people here in Grand Forks, we can't buy their wood. It gets shipped, shipped to the States. Right. Whereas the Herit Proctic, Proctor model and some of the other smaller um, forestry models too, they're selling directly to locals. Yeah, the whole supply chain seems to come down to, uh, that COVID-19 has kind of brought to light, seems to come down to we should be buying more local and, and staying within our own sort of uh, sustainability locally. And yeah, uh, okay, that's good. So, um, so, so we're making up for jobs if we, if we do this. Um, we, we, could, we sell locally, so we, you're saying we can't even buy when our own timber it has to be shipped and then, you know, well, we're buying some timber somewhere. And when we yeah, yeah, so it, it, it gets, the majority of the, the trees that are cut in BC are either turned in, they're either shipped uh, overseas and as raw logs, mm -hmm. and then they're shipped back to us as manufactured items, mm -hmm. or they're turned into chips and, uh, whatever you and burned um, right. or they're turned into cheap two by fours mm -hmm. so for example sometimes in ground forks at our uh, hardware store here we get logs that come from northern bc for whatever yeah. reason yeah i i wonder if there's ever been a study of how much we waste uh in uh in dumps and, and uh, uh landfills you know beat up two by fours and everything like that they're just sitting in a landfill that people are throwing away too. Um, yeah, at our, at our local dump, they have a separate pile for wood and it is huge. It's huger than the rest of the dump. It's and do they, do they recycle it now or no? Do yeah. they burn it? I, I, I am, I'm not exactly sure what they do with our wood here, but yeah, you know, it seems like, kind of seems like in the past 30 years, there is this whole DIY trend that happened and everybody started renovating their homes like crazy. Yeah. Like, as soon as something went out of style, like, you know, everybody's changing their flooring every five years. Everybody's, all the furniture is disposable. And uh, so many people don't realize that, that our forests are coming down because of that. North American forests, yeah. uh, rainforests. And what I, what I, because my eyes were open to this um, whole forestry thing, when I built a tiny house on wheels to deal with the flooding issue here, I built the frame out of new two by fours but I went to um, building sites and I got as much um, recycled wood as possible for the rest of the structure and I've managed to get um, you know this door behind me is a used door uh, and I most of the mm. tiny houses put together with used materials and yeah there's so much used stuff out there that that's just get turning into waste yeah thank God for restore and uh, I me and my husband just got some pallets uh, th that were being thrown out at a, at a, a construction site and they were cracked pallets so they can't be used but they work just fine we're contributed to the local community garden that has to build its its uh, its garden boxes on pallets to keep it off the ground because the ground used to have a dry cleaner which contaminated the soil. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. But you know, I can reclaim these pallets and, and a lot of people are starting to, to look at that. And, and I'm just appalled that how many businesses, construction businesses aren't sort of, they're just like throwing it into a dumpster and well, it's not our concern kind of thing and not reclaiming everything that they are throwing out and making sure it goes to somebody who can do something with it. You know, it doesn't take that much effort um, to do that kind of practice. No, absolutely not. And I was really good, good with my timing. They had built a new apartment complex nearby and they had um, five foot lengths of two by twelves they had used for their concrete forms and they were going to throw them away. And the only thing wrong with them was they had some concrete on them. So I lucked out and I got a whole trailer full of two by twelves that were just, they were beautiful pieces of wood. They just needed to have concrete taken off of them. And, and that's, that's the trade off, right? It takes effort to pull pallets apart and turn them into usable wood. It takes effort to, to clean up the wood, but 
in the end, I saved a lot of money. And but I think what's happening, like you mentioned, you know, the COVID and what's happening in our society is we're we're coming to realize that we're going to have to be forced to recycle, reuse, and upscale because all of the the supply chains are being interrupted. They're being impacted, and we're not going to have new stuff always, you know, for cheap anymore. Yeah, yeah. I think I should get. Uh, well, I have some people who practice minimalism, but I think I should get somebody who's a real expert in, uh, you know, the three R's we were told was uh, reuse, uh, what was the third? I, I'm missing one. Reuse, refuse, recycle. refuse, refuse, reuse, recycle. <laughs> but there's another one in there. I forget one of the R's, but, but uh, reuse is often recycle we go right to recycle and we forgot we got to reuse stuff and um there's so much waste there that uh you can go into any restore and get some terrific stuff uh, but there's all kinds of inventive stuff when, when i look at my kirsten dirksen stuff on um on youtube and what people are doing out there for their homing and, and they're basically sidestepping any mortgages or anything like that they're doing a terrific job and they're finding all this stuff enough to build up build a place very very cheaply yes they have to have some skills to do this or they have to find people with some skills but um, lots of people are doing it and just not getting into the trap of owing and uh, I've got to update my kitchen especially if I'm gonna sell this place so I need to do this thing it all has to be in trend and and all those um, TV shows that say we have to do this, we have to do this, we have to make it look gorgeous. Yeah. Okay. So, um, question: Are there some other alternatives people should be using if we if we can't use or we don't want to use wood? What should we be doing for all of our paper and wood products? Well, like you were just talking about, you know seeking out uh, used products as much as possible, using the restores, going to thrift stores. Um, in our community, we have a trash to treasure day, so people put stuff out uh, and we're driving around the neighborhoods, picking up furniture and stuff like that. Um, oh, and you have down. actual days designated? I'm curious about this, sorry. Can you tell we me do, more yeah. about this? Yeah, so uh, trash to treasure day, it's an, a day in, in the spring and everybody just puts stuff out on their their uh, their front driveway and the rest of us drive around and pick stuff up <laughs> and that that it's it's a local sort of we support each other that way and also we've got a ton of in our in our community we've got a ton of buy and sell Facebook pages and people are constantly selling to each other their yeah. youth stuff yeah and and then toilet paper is a huge one um, vast amounts of our forests are being cut down for toilet paper. Really? And yeah, huge amounts of our, and so recycled toilet paper is well worth it. And in where I live, it doesn't cost any more. When it goes on sale, it doesn't cost any more than regular toilet paper. And that is the easiest, cheapest way to save forests is just yeah. stop buying unrecycled toilet paper. I've heard people have different uh, opinions about bamboo too, whether it's good or not, because it, they do, we do import the bamboo from China. I yeah, don't I don't, I don't know too much about the bamboo, but I do know that huge swaths of, of our boreal forests are being cut down in Canada, be flushed down the toilet. Well, um, since you mentioned Canada, so here we are in, in, in uh, Pacific Northwest, but we hear mostly about the the old the growth uh, the cuts being happening in the Amazon, and we say those are the lungs of our planet. That's they're responsible for. Most. But there's there's forests all over the world that uh, are being deforested. So how much do you know about that, and how much you know? Do you want to get this out to the whole world? I know it affected your community. There is personal effects but tell me about what you know or what you've learned. Well, the deforestation uh, in British Columbia is, is affecting communities across British Columbia. Um, so economically, for example, thousands of people lost their jobs in sawmills last year. And um, industrial forestry companies are 
what's going to happen is they're going to log us out and they're going to leave and we're going to be left holding the ecological bill we're going to be left holding the economic bill there's not going to be any future jobs and the level of deforestation in bc is again it's worse than people think uh, recently, three independent scientists came out with a report about old growth forests in BC. It's called uh, BC's Old Growth Forests, A Last Stand for Biodiversity. And it was written by uh, scientists named Holt, Price, and Doust. And they are professional professionals who've been working in forestry for decades. And they were seeing what was happening in BC and they were looking at the data that the BC government was creating about forests and old growth, and they knew that it was incorrect and that it was misleading. So they created their own independent report. And some of the things that they found, for example, um, they, they say that the last of BC's old growth trees will soon be gone. And before we were talking about how forests mitigate our climate for us, and or they manage our climate for us, old growth forests do that best. Old growth forests manage our water, they manage our climate. Um, the other results from this um, study, they found that the amount of old growth forest still standing in the province has been overestimated by more than 20%. And most of the last of what's left is at risk of being logged within the next 12 years. They also found that um, most of the forest that the province and industry is being is counting as old growth is actually small alpine or boggy forest. So it's old, but the trees are not the giants that most people think of when they're referring to old growth. Uh, our forests are, we're being deforested uh, very quickly and the devastation is enormous. And, I would hazard a guess, I don't know too much about the Amazon, but I would hazard a guess to say it's just as bad as the Amazon. We had a really bad fire season a few years ago mm. and the logging on top of that is just devastating BC forests. And I think the forest fires, um, tell me, are they, they worse because of the clear cutting or you know, do you know anything about that? Clear cutting, again, because the clear cutting is happening, our water isn't being managed for us. Mm. So the, the droughts are getting more severe. And the BC yeah. government itself put out a climate uh, assessment a few years ago. I think it was 2019, actually. And they said, in BC, uh, we're going to get more severe floods. We're going to get more severe droughts. Uh, climate change is going to have uh, an impact on the economy and it's going to we're probably going to lose lives because yeah. of that and yeah. there is a direct connection between the amount of deforestation that's happening and climate change right and i'm pretty sure the forestry didn't stop for covid19 it kept going it did yeah whereas everybody else stopped so why hasn't our political parties our governments and in this case in bc it's the ndp and green parties why haven't they been more effective at stopping these bad practices i know there's people lobbying them and i participated in some of that so why why haven't they clued into this well i think the industrial forestry lobby is very strong <clears throat> Um, there are unions that are very strong as well, and they have yeah. a big influence on the BC NDP. Yeah. And also, the legislation that was created a, about 20 years ago that props up, supports industrial forestry, um, it was created by the BC Liberals, and the BC NDP have just continued with it. They've continued with the status quo. Unfortunately, they are not the friends of the environment that everyone hoped they would be. Right. Um, there's only in, in BC, there's only two green MLAs. Uh, they're doing their best to, um, you know, balance things out. But the, the BC NDP essentially is, it's brown. In other words, it's, it's industrial. It's in support of industry. That's yeah. who they are. Yeah. And um, it's going to take a huge, huge amount of protests and pressure from the public for them to change. And that's, yeah. what, that's what I'm hoping to get involved with more people in um, this year in BC. We're gonna have another forest march. We're gonna hold our own forest week and we're gonna start um, lobbying more intensely. I mean, there's tons of people out there 
who've been working on this for a very long time, small community groups, groups across BC like ours, who's whose communities have been devastated by logging have been working in their own sort of little silos independently for a very long time and we've all got to come together and we've got to let people know like most people don't know uh what's going on with clear-cut forestry like i didn't know things were so bad i thought well for sure the government's taking care of this in an ecologically yep. Yep. responsible way but they they greenwash and they 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 change they use words like sustainable and yeah. it has absolutely nothing to do with ecological sustainability. Yeah, they're just using words. Um, yeah, they're just uh, spinning. They're just doing a lot of spin. Um, so what can, what can we do to help? Well, um, our group, we've, um, we've got a, we're undertaking a project. We're hoping to, at some point in time, implement an ecosystem-based conservation plan in our watershed, but that's, there's a lot of steps along the way. We've got huge challenges ahead of us. We've started by writing a report on the state of our watershed and uh, recommendations for how to fix it. This is gonna um, take a lot of effort on our part. So we sure would appreciate people supporting us okay. through donations. So that's boundaryforest.org and we'll put that up, right? Yeah, um, boundaryforest.org, yep. We would sure appreciate help in that way. And we're hoping to, to create, um, a model that can be used in other communities as well. And what's what's at least one thing you would ask people to do in their daily lives that can help? Recycled toilet paper. Recycled toilet paper? Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> it seems so simple. Uh, I, I even know that there are some people who are more radical that they use a ton of little rags and they launder their rags. And um, I'm, I'm like, I'm not sure I'm there yet, <laughs> but but um, but I've often uh, said for paper towels. I didn't know. I don't understand why we're using so many paper towels when my mother uh, never used them. She always used cloths for everything, and that's recyclable and washable, and they last a really really long time. <laughs> so so great. So. Um, I've really enjoyed talking to you and I'd love to see you back to talk more about uh, sort of an update of what's going on there. So, so if there's, uh, keep us informed of what's, if any pivotal, pivotal things happen that you need support on or any milestones that you've made in, in, uh, in your strides. And uh, I really want to thank you for coming on to Press Reset World podcast. Thank you so much, Kat. It's been my pleasure. And yeah, I'd love to come back and, uh, Good luck to everybody. Uh, let's let's all work together and and make make a, a change to this system that's not working for us. Perfect. Thank you. So to our listeners, please leave us a comment and tell your friends to subscribe on PressResetWorld.com or our YouTube channel, which is PRW, and a link should be at the end of our each podcast that's on PressResetWorld.com. It's also on YouTube somewhere. Um, Perhaps you would like make an excellent guest yourself here or have an article to submit to our blog. We're, we're all for that, too. Um, we want your opinion, your expertise, so contact us. So as we say, many minds make deeper wisdom. Till next time. Thanks. <laughs>